Okay, sorry as I get set up here to get my pen going. Okay, today we're going to be talking about um, some marine habitats that share the common features that they are dominated by rather large plants. Um, so far in this course, we've talked about um, uh, areas and habitats that are basically dominated by either phytoplankton, in the case of, well, most of the ocean, um, that is the prior production is done by phytoplankton, <clears throat> and then organic carbon either supports the, the, the organisms that are found in the surface layer, or it makes its way slowly, um, a small part of it makes its way all the way down to the benthic environment. Uh, we also talked about hydrothermal vents, which are um, supported by um, sulfide oxidizing bacteria. So those are habitats um, where the carbon all comes from microbes, basically either algae or bacteria. Today we're going to be talking about habitats that are dominated by much larger organisms. Um, and I've called these big plant habitats. They're big, certainly um, in comparison to the phytoplankton and bacteria, but perhaps big in, in, in any other uh, way you want to define it, especially when you talk about things like kelp and kelp forests. Uh, but we're also going to be talking about sea grasses, um, salt marshes, and mangroves. And what they have in common is that they, uh, besides being big, they live on or close to land. Um, they have to be on or close to land because, uh, of course, they're, they depend on light. And they can't occur in the middle of the ocean and live at 2,000 meters because, of course, no light makes it far, that far down that, to that depth. Um, we're going to see later, um, at, at one point, um, in, in looking at this lecture, I used to have um, only in the title here, that is, um, that the only features that were um, common to all of these organisms is that they're big and live on or close to land. But we'll see that they actually sh share some other very interesting characteristics. So we're going to be talking about kelp, um, which are brown algae, um, seagrasses, um, another type of seagrass, another type of grass that are found in salt marshes, and finally, still another type of organism, mangroves. So these organisms all differ, um, well, except for the two grasses, in terms of their basic biology and taxonomy. Algae, which are really much more closely related to uh, the uh, kelp, are much more closely related to uh, uh, phytoplankton than they are to actually uh, the other higher plants that we see for the sea grasses and salt marshes. And of course, they're, all those are quite different from uh, mangrove trees. So let's start off with kelp. Um, so kelp, there's basically two um, uh, genus names that I want you to remember. Laminaria, which is the, the uh, genus that we see most common on our coast, and Macrocystis, which is the genus that we see on the west coast of this country. They, they are, as I mentioned, they're closer to algae in the sense that they have undifferentiated cells. All the cells are the same, more or less. Um, but even though the, the structure itself looks very complex, and we'll see um, uh, uh, a diagram of a kelp plant in a minute. Um, they also share the, the, uh, the characteristics is that they grow really fast and, and, and grow to uh, fairly big uh, dimensions, uh, some 10, 45 meters high from the, uh, from the uh, ocean bottom. So here's um, uh, uh, kind of a schematic diagram of a kelp plant. Um, and I don't think it's that important for you to know uh, all these different parts, um, but you should know that they have a root-like system, uh, a stipe, which is like their trunk, um, gather, a gas bladder that keeps them um, uh, upright into the, uh, into the water, and blades. So again, even though these, this plant looks like it has parts of it, like a higher plant, in fact, it is, it is an alga, not a, not a higher plant. So we see um, kelp only in um, cold water. Um, perhaps more important than, um, than the fact that it's cold is that it's, it's clear. But at the same time, it's nutrient rich. Now that's kind of a, uh, we don't see that very often. For example, our waters in, near here in this coast in the Delaware estuary are very nutrient rich, uh, but they're certainly not clear. Um, they have to be shallow again because um, these plants are rooted. Um, so, so they can't be in extremely deep water because they simply won't get enough um, light, sunlight. And so usually these are on an open uh, ocean um, as opposed to in a bay or an estuary. So here you see the distribution. We see it, of course, not off our coast, but further north of us. 
um, especially off of Maine. Um, and then on the west coast, we see it, there's macrocystis, um, seen all the way from Alaska down to, uh, quite far south um, of California to uh, Mexico. And so that's because, um, so the nutrients are, are, are high in, on the west coast because of upholding there. It's clear because it's, it's a very shallow, uh, I mean, excuse me, a very, uh, 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 the continental shelf uh, decreases very rapidly into very deep waters. And so there you have a much broader range of possibilities where macrocystis can exist along the coast as opposed to what we see for laminaria. So the important characteristics, again, or important uh, characteristics of the environments where you see calves are, has to be ha have, have high nutrients, um, but clear water um, and shallow water. So these organisms are important. And uh, one reason why we're talking about them is that um, is, is the fact that they support a very large food web. And it's not so much that the, the plant itself is eaten by um, organisms, but rather the detritus, the dead um, uh, leaves and so on from the plant go on to support the deposit feeders. Remember what the deposit feeder is? It's, it's an organism in vertebrate usually that feeds on the detritus that's being deposited onto the sediment of the, of the ocean. Um, and so that goes on to support a detritus-based food web. Um, so in addition to directly feeding organisms and, and supporting food webs, the, the plant itself provides structure for other organisms. Um, it can provide structure for other seaweeds, um, smaller organisms that we see um, more underneath the, the plant, perhaps near the bottom. Um, but in addition, it, it provides hiding places and, and habitats for uh, vertebrates and fish. So this is um, a really important role. And what, we, what we'll see is common with all these large plants is that they're, for the most part, detritus-based systems. And that is the way they support the food chain is via detritus. And then secondly, they support um, other organisms by just providing structure. I said just, but in fact, that's a really important uh, role of these organisms. So in other words, even if they did not provide any carbon, just the mere fact that they are there provides, them, uh, provides other organisms a place to live and hang out. So in the case of kelp, um, there are direct commercial uses of kelp. Um, alginate um, is, a, is, a, is a polysaccharide that's used in um, various food products and in, in, in microbiology. Um, so, uh, and it's, it's also used in other food ingredients. So there are direct commercial uses of kelp um, uh, that that's, uh, we, we, don't, we don't see it here, of course, but you see it in Maine and then Japan is very famous for using kelp for various uh, uh, purposes and dishes. Okay, so another interesting uh, thing about kelp is that it provides this, uh, examples of a tropic cascade. And we've seen this already when we talked about, um, I think it was rocky shores and rocky tidal pools, where, um, where in the case of on the west coast, um, uh, sea otters are a keystone predator. And I brought this up to uh, talk about this very important concept of a keystone predator. And that was... Um, uh, discussed in regard to the uh, rocky intertidal pools where the uh, starfish is a keystone predator. And I brought up uh, sea otters as another example because when sea otters are abundant, they keep uh, the sea urchins uh, in check and that in turn allows the uh, kelp to uh, flourish. When the sea otters were uh, uh, hunted, uh, that allowed the sea urchins to take off, high abundance of sea urchins, and they in turn um, uh, uh, nipped away at the kelp and uh, stopped it from um, flourishing as much as it could. So on the east coast of the U.S., there aren't sea otters. Turns out that kelp and sea urchins migrated um, over geological time to the east coast, but the sea otters never made it for whatever reason. Um, but instead, on the on the east coast of the U.S. near in the Gulf of Maine. Um, uh, cod had that role, and I say had because we just don't have much cod now in the Gulf of Maine. So what happened as cod were being extirpated, it's a extirp extirpated, um, fancy word of being of saying um, overfished and removed from the habitat, um, there was a decline in the kelp population or kelp extent uh, of the kelp 
in these waters. And that was due to this explosion of, of uh, sea urchins. And the sea urchins um, were, previous uh, to our overfishing of them, were being uh, kept in check by the cod. And so without the cod, uh, the sea urchins take off, took off, and just like we saw on the west coast, the kelp suffered. Now, what happened during the um, uh, mid-1980s and um, early 1990s, a fisheries on sea urchins developed. Um, the, the row of the fish of, of sea urchins um, is prized in sushi bars, and uh, not only uh, in Japan, but here as well. And that caused a crash of the sea urchins. And of course, with the crash of the sea urchins, that allowed the, the kelp to come back. So cod were clearly the, the, the keystone predator here. And there was a trophic cascade effect on, on uh, a couple food uh, levels, uh, food chain levels below it in terms of what was happening with the kelp. So it's a cas trophic cascade. So, um, so just to drive that home point home, I just used the same diagram but it replaces sea otter with a cod. Uh, there's a scientific name for it. I don't think it's that important for you to know that name. Um, and so again, when we overfished it, it's not so much that it's extinct, it's just been reduced so much in um, abundance that it allowed the sea urchins to take off and that depressed the uh, kelp uh, populations and, and growth. Um, when the sea urchins were overfished, that allowed the kelp to come back. So now there's concern about, you know, the sea urchin uh, uh, population. So that fishery was shut down when um, managers saw that it was being decimated by the fisheries. But unfortunately, it hasn't come back. And there's several um, ideas about that is that the um, crabs, uh, small juvenile stages of crabs, are pretty good at eating the uh, newly settled sea urchins. And one of the papers I read uh, about this had this uh, kind of uh, scary uh, phrase about uh, when um, adult sea urchins were were introduced to the uh, Gulf of Maine to try to repopulate the uh, the uh, the area, um, they they attracted a swarm of large crabs that uh, quickly uh, just ate them all up. Thousands of these adult sea urchins, and so uh, really didn't work so well. So it's an example of a food web dynamics. Um, we're just preventing the recovery of the sea urchins. And that may also be the case with cod. And we're going to come back to that, that question. I think it's a really fascinating question is that even though um, fishing on cod in off the coast of, of Maine is, is highly regulated, um, it still hasn't come back. And so the question, obvious question is why? And so this brings up this concept we've talked about before as alternative steady state. Um, we may want to put steady state in quotes here. It's not really constant, but at least it's a, a system where it seems to be uh, more or less set. Um, that is, before we overfish cod, cod were abundant, quite famously abundant, uh, when the Europeans first uh, came to uh, North America back in the, oh, the uh, 1700s and 1800s. Oh, shoot. Uh, why did I do that? Anyway, um, so... Uh, so, so that was a, a steady state of sort. But then as we overfish the, um, uh, uh, the cod and remove them from the ecosystem, more or less, um, now we have a new steady state. It's an alternative to the one that was before it. And that steady state, unfortunately, for, for those um, of you who like to eat cod, um, does not have large cod populations. So we're going to, again, come across that uh, and discuss that in more detail later. So here's just a picture of a cod eating a sea urchin and also a uh, adult crab chopping down on, on a sea urchin. So I, before we leave seaweeds, um, again, uh, kelp is a, is a, a very, um, is an alga, not a higher plant. I just want to mention a couple other seaweeds um, that are, are, are common. Um, one is uh, sea lettuce. The common name is for is is Alva, um, or the scientific name is Alva. The genus name is Alva, um, and the common name is sea lettuce. And it gets its name because it looks like just kind of wilted kind of lettuce. And you can see it on our beaches. I I've seen it on our beaches. Just kind of this patch of not very attractive, not very appetizing looking um, a piece of uh, green stuff on the um, on the beach. 
Another one that we don't see around here at all, fortunately, is sargassum. Um, and sargassum um, is a brown alga, uh, whereas C. lettuce is, is a green alga. Those are more of the common names for uh, chlorophytes and uh, I can't remember right now the, the uh, scientific name for brown al algae. So anyway, they're taxonomically quite different. And, and as you may guess, the brown alga has more uh, uh, fucosanthin, uh, a, a secondary ancillary um, pigment, um, whereas green, the green alga have, um, are dominated by chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Anyway, so there's a picture of sargassum. Um, it uh, can be quite uh, common in the sargassal sea in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, here's a picture of it close up. Uh, again, there's, there's a whole ecosystem that's basically associated with this uh, alga um, in the middle of the ocean. But it can be a problem. Um, and this is a picture from, uh, oh, I'm not quite sure where it's from, perhaps someplace down in Florida. I saw it off of the beach of uh, Port Aransas, Texas. Uh, Port Aransas is the uh, home of the Marine Station for the University of Texas. That's right at the tip of uh, Texas there. And, and there's just these, not quite as dramatic as these big piles of, uh, of, uh, of sargassum. Uh, but rows of rows of this stuff, and it's pretty stinky. Um, not not too many tourists would like to go and sit on the beach with uh, sargassum on on it. And this article um, I just found the other day uh, came from the New York Daily News, and the first uh, 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 sentence of the article says, "A slimy brown monster, after slithering free of the Bermuda Triangle, is devouring beaches from Florida to Texas and the Caribbean." So the Bermuda Triangle probably refers to um, the Sargassal Sea, where often these things um, are growing. And there's certainly not a slimy brown monster out there, but once it gets onto the beach, you can see why it would be called that. Anyway, so those are all um, uh, uh, algae, uh, undifferentiated cells. Um, they're primitive cells, and they're quite different from the grasses that we're going to be talking about now seagrasses and marsh grasses. So these are, and from now on, we'll be talking about basically higher plants or vascular plants. So the cells are differentiated. They have, they're, some are specialized for moving water and nutrients throughout the plant, unlike the, the algae that we've been talking about before. So even though kelp is certainly um, large, um, you know, it's a, it's a macro algae, um, it's, its cells itself are quite similar to phytoplankton cells. They're all algae. And that's quite in contrast to, to what we see now for these vascular plants, uh, where they are differentiated. Um, and so these, these grasses are like terrestrial grasses. Um, that includes corn. Um, they're, they're, the type of photosynthesis they do is called C4. The C4 refers to the first main um, byproduct of photosynthesis is a C4 compound as opposed to a C3 compound that we see in other um, plants and algae actually have our C3. Um, organisms. So let's start with um, sea grasses. And this is a genus name that I would like you to remember, Zostra. It's a, it's, you can see there it's about you know, three feet long, up to that um, uh, uh, length, uh, very thin, um, uh, sometimes called eelgrass is another name that's given to this, I guess because it has that kind of a long, thin um, uh, appearance to it. Um, and you can see the distribution is quite common, um, or used to be really common um, in our in inland bays in the Chesapeake Bay, not so much in the Delaware Bay. Um, and, uh, and, and I say not in the Delaware Bay, Delaware Bay because it requires clear water and shallow water. And again, for the same reasons that we talked about so far is that um, this, so this plant is, cannot grow to the, to, to the uh, length that uh, kelp can. So it, it has to occur in even shallower water. And it also still must be clear because, again, of course, it requires light. It's not able to grow in very dim um, water and dim light in cloudy water. So this is an important um, grass. It supports, again, um, uh, uh, food webs. And similarly to what we saw already for the kelp, it's not so much the, the grass itself, but the detritus from the grass that supports um, food webs. And again, it structures the habitat. Um, even if that grass were just plastic, um, and, and, and standing there uh, waving it around in the water, it would help to um, 
uh, provide uh, spawning grounds for fish um, and just serves as a place for these um, uh, juveniles to hang out in, in the case of the Atlantic cod. Um, and also uh, can provide directly food for uh, uh, birds. So there's quite a bit of concern about seagrasses, um, or uh, another uh, term that's used for these uh, these organisms is submerged aquatic uh, vegetation. Um, so uh, uh, seagrasses works as well. So anyway, uh, they are seem to be in decline. Um, in, say, the Chesapeake Bay, there's been a lot of discussion and concern about uh, the, the, the loss of seagrass beds in the eucalyptus bread beds or zostra beds. Um, and, and one cause of that uh, decline is, is because of eutrophication. That is, the, the nutrients from uh, basically fertilizers uh, running uh, uh, in the runoff going into the Chesapeake Bay uh, uh, supports the growth of phytoplankton. And the phytoplankton uh, shade out the seagrasses. So remember, again, the seagrasses require a fair amount of light. They don't like dim light. They require clear water. And that water is not so clear when you have uh, dense phytoplankton um, populations growing due to the eutrophication problem. So, um, so another um, uh, concern, this is probably the, the dominant thing that's happening, is eutrophication and shading of the seagrasses. But another um, uh, uh, possibility, another factor leading to the decline is that because of, of overfishing um, the, the, uh, and removal of fish that normally would graze the epiphytes, that is the, the, um, the organisms that live on top of other um, organisms, in this case, uh, on top of a roof. But here we see the, the epiphytes on top of the seagrasses. Well, we, if we remove those fish, then the epiphytes can just go crazy and ends up smothering the seagrasses. So it's another example of a trophic cascade. So the removal of fish by over overfishing um, doesn't, then the fish themselves don't eat the seagrass, um, but they eat the uh, epiphytes, the, the organisms that are growing on top of the seagrass. So when you remove the fish, you, there's a trophic cascade and the seagrass ends up suffering because of the overgrowth of the epiphytes. So, uh, and another reason um, could be is basically um, uh, uh, disturbances in their in the bottom of the sediment where they're growing by dredging or boat traffic. And then finally, um, there are cases. Um, this is one of the few cases where in the in the oceans where diseases are clearly working at causing. Um, uh, uh, loss of these uh, organisms, especially in the tropics. Um, so that's a big concern. And, and again, um, th there, there are all these diseases affecting these organisms from, you know, way before Europeans came to this part of the country, part of the world. Um, but with all the other things happening, they are, be are even more susceptible to disease um, than they were before uh, Europeans arrived. So, uh, now let's move on to still another uh, type of uh, big plant and another grass, that is the grasses that we see in salt marshes. And the dominant grass, um, and this is another genus name I, I want you to remember, is Spartina. Spartina is the genus of grass that dominates um, uh, uh, salt marshes, at least in North America. There are a couple different species, and we'll see there's a couple different forms, morphotypes of Spartina alterniflora is the dominant species. Um, I don't, I won't ask you to remember the different species, um, but I do want you to remember this, um, this genus name Spartina. So salt marsh, uh, so the reason why we're talking about Spartina and salt uh, marsh grasses is because of the importance of salt marshes. Now salt marshes are basically um, current estuaries. Um, they're dominated by um, marsh grasses. So you have to have uh, the grasses there to be called a salt marsh. And you have to have uh, regular flooding by the tides in order to have these grasses to uh, flourish. And so here is a picture of a Spartina, um, Alterniflora, the, the tall form that's in the foreground right there. Um, and then the shorter form it occurs in two forms, morphotypes, is next. And then way back here, we're going to talk about later at the end, is Phragmites, um, kind of the, the villain in this story. Um, 
But before we get to Phracmites, um, let's again talk about why salt washes are important. So again, really high plant production. And that's another characteristic of all these big plant um, environments is that the plant production is high on a per area basis, on a per area basis. So, so uh, you remember that most of the prime production in the oceans is by phytoplankton. And that's simply because the open oceans is such a large fraction of the total area um, uh, uh, in the whole marine world. Um, but when you look at a per meter squared basis, uh, salt marshes are very productive, um, even more so than tropical forests. And so because of that high production, in part because of that, but also because of the structure provided by marshes, uh, many fish, including those that are uh, important commercially, uh, uh, depend on salt marshes for their development. And in Rhode Island, at least, that number is uh, as high as 7%. So it's, it's a, it's a non-trivial part of the whole commercial fishing industry. Basically, it depends on the salt marsh. Um, and then other organisms also depend on salt marshes, um, such as uh, various types of birds. And then also migrating birds um, will depend on salt marshes for uh, for, again, protection and food. So there's still another um, um, aspect of salt marshes um, uh, uh, that's, that's important to think about, and that is protection uh, from storms. And, and this is a big issue, um, not so much here, but um, down in the, on the Gulf of Mexico and especially in Louisiana. Um, and, the, and the question here is, is about salt protection. So basically to back up, a salt marsh um, basically can help buffer um, uh, tidal surges. So the problem created by hurricanes is not only the direct, um, you know, uh, impact of the winds of a hurricane on on land, but also the surge and and tidal uh, waters coming up from the ocean. And so a salt marsh helps to absorb some of that that blow, and helps to um, uh, protect the uh, uh, coastal areas uh, from damage by hurricanes and large storms. So the question often is referred to as soft versus hard. A hard defense would be having some type of seawall there that stops the water from coming inland. A salt mar a, a soft defense would be uh, something like a salt marsh where the uh, blows are, are, are absorbed by the salt marsh. And, and so there's quite a bit of de a debate about which way um, uh, you know, people in Louisiana should go in terms of uh, pr protection against storms. So salt marshes also help minimize soil erosion um, by basically uh, slowing down the runoff from land. Um, and they also clean water uh, by filtering out things before they reach the ocean. So they're not going to necessarily remove the heavy metals, the, the, the toxins. They'll probably just stay there right in the salt marsh, but um, that may be better, probably is better, than having that water uh, going into the oceans. So they certainly can remove nutrients and they can remove sediments because often that water that's coming off of land is, is high in all those things. And so by having the salt marsh there, as opposed to having no, no salt marsh, um, it's helping to prevent, um, helping to clean up that water before it goes into, uh, into the ocean or, or some bay. So salt marshes are really important. So um, as you uh, uh, can guess, um, it's higher plants that are doing all the prime production in these environments. And again, Spartima is the main genus of, that, of those grasses that dominate in um, salt marshes. Um, and Spartina has, ag again, um, uh, several roles um, in this system of providing not only directly food for these organisms but, and for the rest of the organisms found in salt marshes, but they also um, pr provide um, structure. And they do so by this rhizome system. And it's this, uh, these, uh, these roots, basically, that are intertwined. And so they, um, they, although they do have a sexual phase where they um, uh, po uh, pollinate and, and spread themselves by seeds, um, they're much more effective in spreading by, by roots. And that's true of all grasses, actually. You know, grasses basically spread by um, vegetative growth via roots as opposed to seeds. As, you know, for, for example, around here, uh, grass is spread by that mechanism as opposed to seeds, which often don't germinate above you know, the very high temperatures that we see in our summers. 
So when you see a, a, a stand of Spartana or, or any type of salt marsh grass, often those organisms are basically the same. Um, this, you know, they all uh, derive from the same single plant parent plant and they would have all the same genotype. So as I said, these, these um, the Spartana and other salt marsh grasses are important not only for providing food for organisms, uh, organic carbon, um, they also help structure the environment. They um, stop sediment, as we mentioned already, stop sediment from flowing into, um, into the water and keeps it there. So that allows a buildup of, of the metals um, above the low tide mark of the tides. Um, so that, that results in organic peat, which becomes, again, um, a place where other organisms are, can grow and live. So um, this is an example of ecosystem engineering. It's changing um, the uh, environment around it. It's building up um, the land uh, in many ways. Um, and, it's, and it's providing, again, the structure for um, other organisms. So the term that's sometimes given for this type of behavior is, is, um, is ecosystem engineer. So um, I mentioned already that there are these different forms of um, alternative flora. Um, and this just gives a, a kind of a schematic diagram of the different types of, uh, of, of grasses that we see um, along a salt marsh going from you know, the water, the open water here, all the way up to uh, dry land up here with trees. And the tall form of Spartina um, is found next to the water, uh, followed by the short term, and then moving up, um, uh, uh, up towards dry land. Whereas Phragmites um, is found much um, higher up in the marsh uh, where there's very little salt. So um, what's important is not so much that, you know, that the, the details of where all these organisms are found, but rather that there is this zonation. And it should remind you of what we already seen for the rocky shores. And, and like the rocky shores where there's also zonation, we see these areas of, of different types of mussels and, and with uh, barnacles or not, with uh, uh, macroalgae colonized in rocks or not. Um, so th that type of zonation is also seen in the salt marsh. And, 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 um, and like the rocky shores, competition has a big role in determining where these organisms are found and, and governing the uh, vertical zonation of these organisms. So generally speaking, the low tidal organisms that we see next to the water, it's not so much that they cannot grow in high up um, without the, uh, the, the, the seawater, it's that they are outcompeted um, once they get up there. So you could grow the tall Spartina on dry land, um, it just wouldn't be able to um, outcompete the organisms that are really adapted to live there. And the likewise, the high tidal organisms uh, uh, cannot live in the low tidal zone next to the water here uh, because they can't survive the the uh, they don't like the salt water. So that's not that's more than just competition. That's an example of the physical um, factor affecting uh, the the the. Uh, the survival of this organism in that particular habitat. And we saw that similarly with some barnacle species that were able to um, survive um, really high up the rocks uh, where only the very highest tide reaches, uh, but not in the lower part of the uh, next to the water where it was, uh, uh, it was too physically demanding because of the wave action to survive. So here it's a case of salt water that's causing the high tidal species um, not to, to uh, proliferate. So the lower tidal species are more uh, salt tolerant as opposed to the high tidal species. So um, another um, uh, uh, factor of salt marshes um, is that the sediment is anoxic. So this is very uh, reminiscent and the same as what we saw for um, the benthic environments in shallow um, waters. Where, uh, which are really organic rich, the oxygen disappears uh, very, very rapidly. Only the first couple of millimeters, less than an inch has any oxygen, and the rest is anoxic, that is without any oxygen at all. Um, and Spartana has, has devised a regular tissue, which is basically um, the, this type of tissue that allows um, gases, especially of course oxygen, uh, 
um, to diffuse up and down the plant. Uh, and this is important for roots because basically roots um, um, survive by um, heterotrophy. That is, they need oxygen to oxidize organic material and make energy. And where are they going to get that oxygen if they're basically in an oxic soil? Well, one solution is the regular tissue that, um, again, um, allows ox uh, spartina to pump gases and especially oxygen down to uh, the root system. And that's important not only for spartina, but actually is important for the surrounding um, uh, soil or, or sediment right around the roots, which can get a little bit of oxygen from, um, uh, from the root, roots uh, that are leaking it. So another mechanism to get a little bit more oxygen down there is, again, this, this um, action by uh, invertebrates. And we've seen this again with the um, uh, uh, shallow uh, benthic environments where it's bioturbation, where basically organisms are, are bioturbation. I'm not going to try to write it out, bioturbation, um, where organisms are, are, are burning down into the sediment and, of course, allowing oxygen to diffuse and other gases to diffuse in. And that may help um, the aspartina growth and basically provide more oxygen down where there wouldn't be um, any oxygen. So there, these fiddler crabs are probably um, uh, burrowing down there to escape predators. Um, uh, so that's that's why they're doing it. Okay, so we mentioned already about how these uh, why salt marshes are important, and especially the creeks. That is the Kind of little rivers that are going in between the, the grasses, um, lots of invertebrates, um, nursery grounds uh, for various fish, uh, commercial and otherwise. So this is um, uh, just a uh, you know a little diagram showing the importance of uh, salt marshes for stripers, which um, some of you may be interested in. So the big ones may be living and coming from um, shallow waters of uh, of uh, salt marshes. But I want to mention another um, type of fish that uh, probably is not uh, targeted by you fishermen among you, and that is fungulus or munichuk. Um, and, and there are the two genus names and, and species name that we see both on the East Coast and Gulf of Mexico. But I just want you to remember the genus name, fungulus. And it's um, uh, important because it's a, it's a prey for other uh, species that you may be more interested in. And, um, and, and these um, predators come in from deeper waters um, and, and come into the marsh and eat um, uh, fungulus. And so that's a way of connecting the coastal system with the marshes, uh, coastal marsh systems with deeper waters. Um, another reason why I want you to remember uh, this genus name is because it's been looked at quite extensively uh, by actually investigators here at Delaware, uh, Professor Tim Target, who just left the university um, and moved up with his wife, uh, Nancy Target, to University of New Hampshire. But many other folks have looked at fungulus because it's, it's, a, it's an interesting fish to look at various issues with regard to oxygen um, and low oxygen and hypoxia problems. And so we're going to probably talk about fungus later when we talk about dead zones. But it's a really tough little fish because it's really resistant to um, uh, changes in not only oxygen but also salinity and so the eurotrophic is a one word to describe um, uh, a organism that's able to uh, withstand these extremes of salinity as and low oxygen um, i don't think that's important for you to remember but it isn't the, the that term uh, eurotrophic but i do want you to remember fungulus and the fact that it's able to withstand uh, low oxygen uh, we'll come across that again when we talk about dead zones Okay, so another grass that we have to mention when we talk about salt marshes. Uh, so the, the dominant form that we see is Bartina, um, the tall and then the short form. Um, but way back here is, is the villain of the story, Phragmites. You don't see it in really um, salty water. Um, it's more of a freshwater uh, marsh grass. Um, you do see it in brackish water. Um, and it's competing in some ways with the grasses um, that are normally found there. Because although it's been around for a long, long time, so that's a, that's a genus name I want you to remember. Um, you perhaps have heard about it already because it's, um, that genus name is used even in the, in the newspapers to describe this, um, what 
is becoming a bit of a pest. So it's been around for a while, um, but it seems to be spreading. Um, and it became much more of a uh, recognized as being a problem in the 1990s, as you can see there. So the question is why? Um, is it is because of uh, just natural causes? Um, is it because the habitats have been disturbed by us? Or is it an invasion? A invasion of a, uh, you know, from someplace else. And so um, we have the, um, the luxury or the advantage of looking at this organism because uh, we have not only the, the uh, plants that are around today, but we have samples that have been kept and um, preserved dating back uh, as, as late as, um, as far back as the 1700s in various imbariums. And so even though this has been dried out, there's still enough DNA uh, so that uh, is preserved. Um, uh, and sometimes the you know, plant has been fixed to pages but uh, they can still be extracted for their DNA. Um, and just, just as an aside, this is a really, I think, a fascinating uh, uh, application of molecular tools to look at these organisms. Um, uh, uh, perhaps I mentioned about the fact that you can get DNA from uh, various fossils dating back millions of years. And, um, and it's been used to look at our own evolution as well as the evolution of many other organisms. So in this case, uh, the question is, well, uh, we, we have these samples of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, Phragmites dating back um, several uh, hundreds of years even. Um, is it new or not? And is, do they, uh, are they similar to what we see in today or not? And so as we've saw, seen before, one of the first steps um, you do is you do a PCR reaction. And this becomes really crucial because the amount of DNA that you can get from a dried um, plant is very low. So you need PCR to get enough of the material to do analysis. Now in this case, rather than, you may remember that the genes that were used uh, for identifying organisms was a cytochrome oxidase 1 gene. Also, the, um, in the case of uh, some organisms, a 16S um, ribosomal RNA. But, but for this problem, uh, we need something that's um, uh, able to look at um, uh, more recently evolved uh, organisms. And so for that, uh, one gene that's looked at is the gene that's involved in fixing CO2. And then other genes have been lo looked at um, that are found in the chloroplast. And so you do the PCR and then of course you sequence. Um, and we've talked already about how that's become uh, much cheaper and easier to do than it was in the past. So here's the answer. So the native habitat, habitat, I mean, native in the sense that we were seen uh, long before there was much, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, exchange and global trade, um, was found throughout all the country. And you can see again, Phragmites is basically a freshwater uh, marsh plant, um, and it's only seen in, in like brackish water, uh, really low salinity, and the what now we know is to, to be the invasive haplotype. Hap, haplotype. Um, haplotype is basically just a, uh, a word to describe a variation of this uh, species. So, um, so again, here's the native after 1960. Um, you know, roughly the same uh, range as before. There's two native versions of it. And then the invasive one you can see has increased quite a bit from 1910 to 1960. And here's just some more details for um, uh, New England, basically, Massachusetts, and looks like Connecticut and Rhode Island. So basically, there has been this invasion by, um, uh, by a, a, a different variety. And it's thought to come from um, Europe or Asia. It's not quite clear, at least uh, when I looked at this last time, where actually this haplotype M is from. Uh, YM, I'm not sure why it's called M just probably because all the other letters in the alphabet were used up before they um, got to M. Anyway, um, so the question is, why is M taking over? Why, you know, why has M done so well uh, compared to the native uh, haplotypes? And, and, and it seems that it grows really quickly. Um, and then this is, this is where we come into play. Um, it grows better when there's high nutrients. So, um, you know, one common theme that I hope you picked up on is that one, um, 
uh, problem that we're causing is the introduction of nutrients, basically from fertilizers, that are uh, causing eutrophication in phytoplankton blooms, but it also causes this um, one version of Phragmites to, to do really well. And so the other part of the equation may be is because we are upsetting um, salt marshes that they are more uh, susceptible to being uh, uh, taken over by this foreign haplotype. So that's another um, uh, uh, theme that we've seen before is that in the case of the cod, um, you know, when we remove the cod, it, it was disturbed and something new took over. Um, similarly here, if you mess around with the salt marsh um, by uh, causing development or changes in the uh, water flow or whatever, um, it's perhaps more likely to be uh, taken over by this new invader. So, um, so it seems to be quite widespread, this invasive, uh, uh, I won't call it species, but uh, 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 version of Phragmites. Um, covers more area, so that's one thing. It, it's really kind of taken over not only the original area uh, of the native, but it covers, it's found in more places than the native. And so the reason why this is a problem is because, first of all, if you have expensive uh, beachfront property or, or property that, uh, along a marsh that you like to look at, um, it may be too tall, simply. So it may be as simple as that and block your view of the water. When it dries out, it becomes a fire hazard. Um, it can you know, create uh, that problem. Um, it also changes the structure of the marsh. And in some ways, this is even more um, you know, insidious and, and a bigger impact um, than these other two. Uh, it does that by eliminating the small um, uh, channels. Um, it apparently grows uh, more densely together. And that becomes uh, tougher for other organisms to deal with. And then also um, because it, it's it's changing the structure and has these smaller channels or even uh, many fewer of them, it's causing um, uh, the marsh to, to basically increase in uh, more sediments trapped there, increasing its ele elevation, and that's um, stopping um, salt water uh, salt water from going up into the marsh um, and uh, reducing nutrients. Um, so. Um, uh, so I mentioned that the only, I said before, this is the only common property is, is that they live close to land. Um, but in fact, we'll see in a moment that all these organisms have the common property of, of providing um, detritus for um, other organisms. And that's the case that we haven't, I haven't said that much about salt marshes, but that's in fact what happens with salt marsh systems. Is that so much that the grass itself is food, but the detritus from the grass you know, once the grass dies, it becomes detritus, and that supports a lot of the organisms that are found there. So we're going to add one more um, organism um, to the mix here, and that is mangroves. So these are, of course, not grasses, but trees. So, so mangroves are found uh, basically in tropical and subtropical areas. Um, in terms of uh, uh, this country, it's basically found in Florida, and I guess a little bit in Louisiana. Only where it's, of course, warm. And again, it has to be found um, uh, on land because uh, we'll see in a moment that this is definitely um, you know, more of a, uh, uh, of a land plant with some water around it as opposed to a marine plant with uh, close to land. So there's the genus name, Rhizophoria. I don't think that's worthwhile for you to remember. Um, there are many different uh, versions of its species ranging from, you can see there from small uh, trees to fairly large um, trees, some 60 meters high. So like the salt marsh um, grasses, uh, spark, uh, the, the mangroves have to deal with the noxic muck. So the same thing that we see in shell benthic environments and salt marsh um, habitats, we see also in mangrove uh, uh, forests, is that the, uh, only the, the top layer is, um, has any oxygen. And once you get below a few millimeters, uh, there's no there's no oxygen. So the way in which mangroves deal with that is, is rather than sending roots down uh, rather deep, which is the case what Spartina does, it has this very shallow root system, and it has these mechanisms like aerial roots, and these these um, these 
protuberances that stick above the sediment to gather oxygen. So, um, so I, that's how it deals with the lack of oxygen in its root system. Now, mangroves also have to deal with the fact that it's very salty, um, even more salty than what we saw for the salt marsh grasses, which are basically, you know, can get rather um, low salt, whereas these are found in uh, pretty much full strength seawater their, their entire life. And so they, they deal with that, they, they get rid of the salt by ex excluding it uh, through these salt glands. Um, and you can see the salt uh, kind of gathering on the leaf uh, surface. So a general name to describe these organisms that are able to um, grow in high salt concentrations is halophyte. Halo meaning salt and phyte meaning um, it's a plant. So we could have used that word to describe uh, salt marsh grasses. That's, that's often used to describe salt marsh grasses. We don't use that word to describe uh, phytoplankton, for example, or kelp. Um, it's usually only used to describe something like a mangrove or salt marsh grasses. So these are very highly productive systems, um, like what we've seen for, for all of these big plant habitats. Um, and, and just to put that numbers, uh, the, I'm going to flash up in a minute the number for the mangrove uh, 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 plant uh, productivity. But um, just to uh, put that number in perspective, per perspective, just look at the productivity for uh, salt marshes. Um, coral reefs and, and seabeds, they're extremely high on a per meter square basis. So on the aerial basis, they're really high. And some of the highest that we see, um, coral reefs are, you know, among the highest. But uh, mangroves are right up there also. Um, and there's probably really much, not much of a difference between all those numbers there. The point is, is that mangroves um, and all these big uh, uh, plant habitats are quite productive. So again, um, uh, with all these organisms, there's a, 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 a lots of detritus that comes from the leaves, and it's the detritus itself that supports the food web, not the plant uh, directly. And again, like we've seen uh, with many of these, um, uh, with all the big plants uh, that we've talked about today, is that these provide support for many organisms. So the roots themselves can um, provide support in this. It's kind of hard to see, but there's some oysters attached to the uh, to the um, uh, the roots there. And here's a mud crab mud crab coming out of a burrow next to one of these aerial protuberances that are coming out from the roots of the mangrove to get oxygen. And then the branches and 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 upper canopy of the uh, mangrove can provide uh, nesting spots for birds and so on. So it can provide structure for these organisms. So that's a common feature um, of all these big plant habitats. It's the detritus um, uh, that supports the food web, not necessarily the plant itself, but the dead parts of it that are that come from when it dies, broken off or whatever, um, that is used as carbon source to support the food web. The, uh, and also these organisms are um, ecosystem engineers. Um, the the uh, the uh, even if the mangrove and, uh, were, were just plastic, um, they would still be uh, home to many organisms because of the fact that they provide a physical structure, uh, and, and they change the way in which um, sediment interacts with um, with the water. They trap sediments, um, and so they they have a, a big impact on the physical environment uh, around them. Uh, in addition to providing uh, food for uh, organisms. Um, you could argue that many organisms are, are in ecosystem engineers. Uh, when I Googled ecosystem engineers just to see what the Google had to say about that term, um, it listed phytoplankton. And you remember how phytoplankton um, affects the, the light quality. And if you have too much phytoplankton, um, it decreases light availability so that uh, the eelgrass or zostra the seagrasses um, cannot uh, 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 grow. And so the phytoplankton all are also uh, uh, of a sort, ecosystem engineers. Um, but I think this, this, this term is used more for these larger plants like the kelp, where clearly the whole environment is, is structured by their presence, and likewise for mangroves and all, uh, basically all the plants that we've been talking about today. So here's just a, um, uh, 
picture showing the extent of a mangrove forest along a tropical tidal creek, uh, I guess in uh, Mexico. And we're kind of coming up to the end. And, um, and you, as you perhaps can guess, that's not often the case. This is not um, uh, always seen with regard to mangrove uh, forests because often you get developments around them. And that's one of the big problems that we see uh, facing mangrove forests is that they're being cut down and used um, that that area land is being used for um, shrimp farms and other maricultures. So that's some of the problems facing mangroves is that um, being next to the water and being uh, places where people want to get fish, um, either uh, you know by fishing or by creating uh, mariculture, aquaculture, um, they are cut down and 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 decimated that way. Um, of course, uh, you don't have to uh, uh, necessarily want to have fish to want to cut down a mangrove if you want to build a hotel um, uh, with a water view. And so that's another problem facing mangroves. And then a final one that perhaps, um, I, I think these seem kind of obvious that um, anything that's developed along the shore is going to be um, a problem facing mangroves, but one that may not be quite as obvious is sea level rise. And the problem there is is that not so much that sea level rise itself is going to uh, kill off the mangrove, is that we have developed behind the mangroves. Even if we left the mangroves there, um, uh, uh, the mangroves can't migrate back uh, back up the, sh up the, the shore, up on land, as the water increases because we have developments um, that are stopping it from moving. So, so that's, that's the lack of sediment uh, accretion. That is the ability to uh, uh, trap sediment for it to, to basically grow in these waters that are now um, uh, have more and more, uh, uh, more and more water, the water level is increasing. And they're not, not able to migrate um, up shore um, as sea level rises. Um, and of course, that's caused by us uh, because of, of increasing CO2 concentrations. Basically, what's happening is the, uh, is the, as, the sea, uh, as the oceans warm up, that will increase the volume of the oceans and cause sea levels to rise. And then also the melting of, of ice on Greenland and um, other places, glaciers that are causing the uh, input of that melted water into the oceans is also causing sea level to rise. And so that has a big impact, of course, on many things, but mangroves um, may be especially threatened by sea level rise. And there's some reports in, in fears that it may be gone uh, within a, you know, probably in your lifetime. Um, there's a chance that we may, you may see the last of the mangroves. Okay, well, that's a little bit depressing thought to the end on, but I hope you now appreciate the importance of some of these larger plants um, and their habitats.